unique opportunity we have to turn our country around to get back to the principles America was founded on. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is You Built It, But Do You Own It? A debate on Obama's initiative to reduce intellectual property rights. What is an idea? Advances in science, technology, transportation, and even entertainment. Every facet of everything in our lives started as an idea. But what would happen if you couldn't own your own ideas? Creativity itself would stop. The framers knew this. That's why in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, they wrote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. As John Locke said, the government is morally obliged to serve people namely by protecting life, liberty, and property. But what if the government no longer protects that property? It's your idea, your property. Protect it. You built it, but do you own it? That's what this panel is going to discuss today. It's one of the most important questions pending before Congress. President Obama is pushing for massive changes to the way you use and intera interact with technology today. In fact, as we speak, and I literally mean as we speak, the Federal Communications Commission is voting on President Obama's net neutrality proposal. The president is turning his sights next to intellectual property. And what is intellectual property? It, it's the inventive ideas that people have a patent on or it's the, the words that, that an author pens. They own that, and my phone is now ringing. I better turn this off, <laughs> as my friend is calling me. Um, but when an author pens a, a work, or when an inventor creates something, they own that idea, they own that technology. But the president is trying to diminish the rights of, of, of the people who have these creative ideas and inventions. So Congress now has uh, work to do uh, on, on how to respond to President Obama's call for these changes. Um, there's uh, concerns about patent litigation, about copyright review, and about trade. Some say that, that these protections harm innovation. Others say that they are the, the, the engine that grows the economy. I've got three leading experts in, from the, uh, in the country today. Um, Adam Mazoff, co-director of the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property Rights and a professor at George Mason University. I've got Mark Schultz, another co-director of the center and also a professor at the University, or Southern Illinois University. And then Maureen Olhausen, who is one of the two strong conservatives at the Federal Trade Commission, another regulatory agency in the government. Adam is going to start off by giving us some context on this issue. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> and I will. So it used to be the case if you mentioned intellectual property, such as patents on new inventions and ideas or copyrights on creative works of art or writings, very few people would have been specifically aware of this. But because of the digital revolution of the past uh, couple decades, the great uh, advances in biotechnology and in medicine, all of this brought to us by the patent system, copyrights, and related intellectual property rights like trademarks and trade secrets, people have become much more aware of these issues and they've become to take front and center. So you hear about issues now in newspapers, you, you read about them on the internet, that their patents are alleged to hold up innovation. People claim that the, there are these uh, creatures known as patent trolls who have patents, who sue manufacturers. Copyright in digital content books and music and movies is alleged to stifle free speech or hold up new creative development and new creative art, and so on and so on. In response to many of these complaints, Congress and regulatory agencies and the courts are now 
considering wide-ranging limitations on our patents and our copyrights and other IP rights. They're seeking to roll back and weaken these property rights and make it easier for people to use other people's created inventions, other people's created works of art and music. So as, as Dan mentioned, Congress is considering legislation that will significantly weaken patents at this very moment. And Congress is ongoing reviewing the copyright work, uh, uh, statutes and is considering making changes also to copyright to accommodate more use of copyrighted works by, by the non-owners. <clears throat> and the courts, especially the Supreme Court, have handed down a slew of cases. In fact, the Supreme Court is deciding, uh, in particular patent cases, but intellectual cases more generally, at a rate that we have not seen since the late 19th century. And so it's very, there's a lot of uh, political and legal activity surrounding what are intellectual property rights today. And thus it's important for us to remind ourselves what are intellectual property rights and why these are essential key property rights that have served a fundamental role in the American experience that began over 200 years ago. We happen to forget this. Many people don't remember that part of American exceptionalism, part of the American Revolution, wasn't just the creation of a government that represented the rights of all individuals to their life, liberty, and property, but it also extended into all spheres of activities, including intellectual property. Thus, the founders put intellectual property into the Constitution itself, authorizing Congress to enact the patent laws and copyright laws to secure to inventors and authors and other creators their valuable creations. They did so under the long-standing view of such great thinkers like John Locke, who endorsed copyright, endorsed property rights and inventions. And they recognized that these are the fruits of people's labors, their intellectual labors. And in fact, that these come from a source that is the source of everything, our minds. And thus is rooted not even in the tangible world, but actually in the new ideas that people come up with. And thus, the United States did something unique that was not done by any other country at that time. We took serious the idea that intellectual property is a property right. So contrary to England and France, Germany, and other countries at that time, we protected these not as special grants of privilege, but as property rights. And the result, as we all well know, and we're living it to this very day, was the explosive growth in the Industrial Revolution in the United States, founded on amazing patented innovation in the, the mechanized reaper, the cotton gin, the sewing machines, the telegraph, eventually the telephone, the light bulb, uh, airplanes, radio, lasers, and today our computer technology itself. And so it's very important to remember that key to the United States is success, both its free market, its innovative innovation economy, and to the very notion of what it means to secure property in America and to secure to everyone their life, liberty, and property, that that must include the protection of people's rights to the fruits of their labors and the inventions and books that they have come up with. And as I said, this is important to remember because today these very ideas are under attack. And they're under attack not just from the left. Unfortunately, many people who are advocates for the free market and for limited government have themselves become confused about what it means to secure intellectual property to inventors and authors and other creators. And they have and thus become begun to think that we must roll back these rights in some way, shape, or form. And therefore, we must remind them that know that this is, these are important, that these are strong protection of these types of property rights are key to the ongoing success of America's innovation economy, to the growth of our jobs, to the growth of all of the great technology in our computers and our medical treatment that, that we now experience today, that even 10 or 15 or 20 years ago was pure science fiction and yet was brought to us by the great innovators who rely upon our patent system and our copyright system, and will continue to do so hopefully in the future. So, thank you.
When I think about why we should or indeed must protect intellectual property, I'm reminded of something President Ronald Reagan said when I was a young conservative in the 1980s. Uh, he said, freedom is right, freedom works. Now, it wasn't his most famous quote, or, or, and he has hundreds more eloquent ones, but it stuck with me because in those five words, freedom is right, freedom works, it summarizes the value of our conservative principles. Our principles are right because they recognize the intrinsic value of every human life. People are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights to their life, liberty, and property. No human being is a means to the end of another. No human being's work should be taken or appropriated by another, whether a government or another. We are all ends in ourselves. And our principles work. They work for the same reason they're right. They work because they recognize the intrinsic value of people. When we have economic freedom, when we have individual liberty, we work harder to, do, to get the things we need to support ourselves and our families. And in working harder, we innovate and create and benefit all society. And by the same principle, by the same understanding, property rights are essential because they are also right and they work. Property rights ensure that every individual can own the fruits of their labor, own and enjoy them, and thus secure the things they need to support themselves and their families, but also to really live fulfilling lives, to have the means to live fulfilling lives. And not just that, but true freedom. Government handouts and freedom are incompatible. Property rights give us the freedom to be truly independent. And as goes for uh, our other principles, property rights work. We work harder and the economy prospers when we're free. And intellectual property is the same. Intellectual property is right. Intellectual property works. Intellectual property is right because it's property like any other property in its most important ways. When we look at the work of a farmer who's plowing a field, who creates something out of nothing, they're much the same in these important ways as an inventor who creates a smartphone. They bring something out of nothing and each needs and deserves to own the fruits of their labor, to support themselves and their family, to be truly economically independent. And this principle is the same when it comes to the architect who designs a building and the carpenter who, who works on it, the, uh, the wedding photographer who takes photos and the baker who bakes the wedding cake, the animator who draws the movie and the movie theater owner who sells the tickets. In each case, they need and deserve their property rights. They need them to, to support their families and themselves. They need them to be truly free. And we can see in this way that intellectual property rights are right and they work. And they support freedom in important ways. Intellectual property rights support economic independence, like any other property right. What we have to, we all value owning a home, for example, because of the independence it gives us. We value businesses having property rights. A business like Hobby Lobby or Chick-fil-A can choose to close on a Sunday because they make the own rules, their own rules because they own the property. Similarly, a filmmaker like Clint Eastwood can make a movie, choose to make a movie about Chris Kyle. Uh, American Sniper. He would not get the opportunity to make that movie if he had to go to a government board and ask bureaucrats to fund it. Instead, he has property rights and the free market gives him the opportunity to make that money, to make that movie. Finally, consider the importance of intellectual property rights in securing a free society. All property rights disperse and distribute power. The more people who own property, the more freedom there is distributed through a society. And this holds true just the same for intellectual property. Copyright owners have the independence they need to choose to speak how they want and the economic opportunity 
to pursue their right to speak, and thus the copyright has been called by the Supreme Court the engine of free expression. Similarly, an inventor can walk their own path. Inventors often are doubted uh, before they're, they're heralded. People can't believe that their inventions will work. Erwin Jacobs, the founder of Qualcomm, the company that made the mobile telecommunications revolution possible, was told his invention violated the laws of physics. Well, we all stand testament today using our phones that that's not true. But luckily, he didn't have to convince a board of scientists or a government to fund his project. He had patents, and the patents gave him the property rights that secured the opportunity to build this invention that we all enjoy today. So, remember, intellectual property rights are both right and they work. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking at CPAC about the fight over IP rights that is going on right now in DC and all over the world. On one side of the debate, we have companies and some foreign governments, those that are net buyers or licensees of IP, looking to make IP cheaper for them to license to use in their products. On the other side of the debate, we have companies and small inventors that, on balance, focus their time and energy on idea development and patent licensing to make money. They, of course, want enforceable property rights to justify all the risk and effort needed to create valuable new ideas. I agree with Adam and Mark that it is critical for America to promote strong IP rights. To begin with, our belief in, in, in individual property rights sets us apart from so many p other people around the world. As Thomas Jefferson wisely observed, the true foundation of Republican government is the equal right of every citizen in his person and property and in their management. The fruit of your intellectual labor is individual property that should be as strongly protected from theft or trespass as your home. And that is true whether the transgressor is the government or a private party. But in addition to these reasons, as if we really needed more, as an FTC commissioner and as a Republican, I also see this as a debate about competition policy and how to keep America prosperous in the years ahead. A modern economy needs both innovation and commercialization to promote widespread spread gains for its citizens. Now, some tension exists between these two ingredients for a strong economy because coming up with valuable ideas requires investment and risk-taking focused on future possibilities. Some ideas or inventions will fail. While turning ideas into successful products requires capitalizing on already existing ideas. The trick is to balance one with the other so that we can produce the products of today efficiently and at the same time invest in creating the products of tomorrow. Both our competition and our intellectual property laws play a valuable role in balancing our goals for today and the others just over the horizon. Our competition laws focus heavily on promoting our economic goals for the near term, with an eye in particular on producing efficiencies. We ensure a level playing field by eliminating anti-competitive conduct and help create incentives for businesses to enter and compete as efficiently and as aggressively as possible. This competition translates into lower prices and higher quality for consumers and can even yield long-term gains by reinforcing the drive to innovate and beat competitors over time. As the Supreme Court wrote just yesterday, federal antitrust law is a central safeguard for the nation's free market structures. In this regard, it is as important to the preservation of economic freedom and our free enterprise system as the Bill of Rights is to the protection of our fundamental personal freedoms. On the other hand, the intellectual property laws are designed with an eye to future competition and economic growth. The Supreme Court said our IP system is important to create an incentive to inventors to risk the often enormous costs 
in terms of time, research, and development. The productive effort thereby fostered will have a positive effect on society through the introduction of new products and processes of manufacture into the economy. In exchange for this reward for inventions, the patent laws require the inventor to disclose his or her idea so that after their period of exclusivity requires, the knowledge of the invention goes to the people who are thus enabled without restriction to practice it and profit by its use. Combining strong IP rights with smart competition enforcement can promote a strong economy with both innovation and commercialization. Let me close by noting that there is an international dimension to all of this that people should keep in mind. Many countries are far behind the United States in terms of developing valuable intellectual property. This is especially true of countries with emerging economies that are oriented to manufacturing and exports, like China. These countries are actively evaluating how to treat IP rights, and importantly, some of these nations are focused on how to redu reduce the control by American firms of IP that serves as an input into the goods in, uh, made in those overseas markets. These emerging markets have the most to gain from efforts in America to weaken intellectual property rights, as it will offer their governments cover to minimize IP protections, lower the costs of goods for their domestic companies, and reduce payments to potential competitors and IP owners here in the US. I think that people should keep that in mind the next time they consider devaluing patents here, as that action may have unintended consequences globally. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, some, for some of you who have just joined us or are joining us, this is about intellectual property. It, it's, it's the stuff that makes up the things that we use every day. And our three panelists have made some very interesting comments. Um, I own a house. And if somebody wants to come into my house and I don't want them to, I can call the police and say, please take this individual off my property. This person does not have my permission. I know that with intellectual property, people can hire a lawyer. And uh, um, there's been some discussion about uh, something called a patent troll. What, when is it appropriate for somebody to hire a lawyer to say, please protect my property? And when is that lawyer merely a troll who's feeding off of the lives of others? <laughs> Dan, that's, a, that's an, a great question. And um, you hear this phrase patent troll used a lot today in discussions about patents and patent innovation. And um, one of the real problems with this term is, is that it, it's, it's not really defined in any way, shape, or form. And by the way, there's, there's an interesting uh, correlation here in the same way that you, know, you often heard about robber barons at the turn of the 20th century with the rise of the importance of industrial property. You now have a new term to attack the creators and owners of intellectual property, patent innovation, patent troll, and is being used to drive legislation and regulations. Um, and this term is basically used to attack anyone who owns a patent, who then brings a lawsuit to defend, or I mean, to, against someone who infringes their, their patent innovation. Um, and it's been used, it would cover great inventors like Thomas Edison and Charles Goodyear of vulcanized rubber and Nikola Tesla of, of electricity. Um, and it's also used to cover great companies. Like, what do you mean by used to? The term is used to, to include when they attack patent trolls. I mean that they would be called included, patent trolls yes. today. In fact, they would be called and accused of being patent trolls today, yes. And it's, and it's part of a rhetorical push to try to weaken patents. Because yes, when people infringe your property rights, just like you have to call a uh, policeman to defend your home, if someone infringes your property rights in a new invention, you have to contact a lawyer to bring a lawsuit to, make, to stop them. Uh -huh. And your ability to actually go into the market and to license freely and to sell products is predicated upon your ability to stop people from infringing upon your rights uh -huh. in the same way your ability to use your home is, is predicated on your ability to be able to kick people off if you don't want them in your home. 
Now, now there is a definition of patent troll that, that's a surefire one. Anyone who's suing me for patent infringement is a patent troll. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's the most surefire way to define it. And we have to keep in mind that this legislation that limits access, uh, the access of inventors and patent owners to the courtroom hurts the little guys, not the big guys. They can overcome those obstacles. Big companies, they have the money to enforce their rights. It's the, little, the garage inventors, the little guys who can't afford to enforce their rights. And that's why some big companies are behind this push, because they know it'll make it easier for them to do business because it'll make the input of their businesses cheaper. They don't have to innovate, they can just take others' innovations and not worry about those little guys suing them. As in so many um, issues, there's, there's a kernel of truth to this concern that's being raised about patent trolls. There are perhaps a very small number of of entities, law firms, who've tried to uh, blanket small businesses, mom and pop, coffee shops, with false claims uh, that uh, they were infringing some kind of patent. I think the question there is to look at that type of harm and to address it directly. So the FTC has actually sued uh, a patent assertion entity that sent out abusive and deceptive demand letters to small businesses. And we reached a settlement with them, and they were prohibited from now, doing that in the future. Maureen, when you say the FTC, that's the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade yes. Commission, where I'm a, a commissioner. But that is something where we already have the tools in hand to address that abusive behavior. I, I, Maureen's comments are, are, are very well made, because it's exactly the point. is that, yes, there's always a kernel of truth which is, is, is used to leverage the rhetoric that is always used to weaken property rights. Right. So the grumpy old man who owns his home, who terrorizes people in the neighborhood, Right? We don't decide, okay, we're going to weaken everyone's property rights in the entire country because there's a particular individual who's a, being abusive with respect to his property rights and his land. And yet that's exactly what they're doing with respect to the patent system now. Well, well Mark, you, you made a very interesting comment that the more people who own property, the more freedom there is in society. Well, some property is you know, the thought process of a writer. You know, who writes a novel or writes a script. What if I want to see Batman fighting, you know, a Marvel character? Don't I, you know, how can I make that happen if, if there are certain copyrights that prevent that? Well, I, I think what, this is a common critique of, of copyright these days, that, that somehow it stops people from creating the expressions they want because they say they need to use others' expression to express themselves. But, but here's the thing we need to understand. When we talk about, when we're worried about patent litigation, when we're worried about copyright lawsuits, when we talk about those things, we're only looking at a very small part of the intellectual property system. Property rights facilitate cooperation. You invite your friends over your house every day. People go, you, you're part of a congregation, the congregation owns a church, you worship there every Sunday. That's what property rights are for. They enable us to cooperate and enjoy our property. And every once in a while, we have to go to court to defend them. So look, if somebody wants to see Spider-Man team up with Batman, um, those two companies can get together and make a deal. And you know what? It's happened many times before, actually. As a kid, I collected those comics. So that kind of private cooperation happens. People want to use their property rights, um, not stop other people from enjoying them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, look, I want to tease out just two interesting things here. That I, you know, on one hand, people deserve the right to own the fruits of their labor. I heard that from all three of you, the fruits of your labor. What you, I think it was John Locke who wrote that what you put your hand to, you know, that becomes yours, something to that effect. Um, yet, at the same time, we want everybody to have access to, to the, the benefit that's created by the, these inventions. How, how do we strike that balance? Well, the commercial market is what enables that access. We all know this, right? We, the reason a free economy gives us so much choice is because of that freedom, because there are many different products from which to choose. That's what facilitates action. 
uh, access, the profit motive. That's what gets people to create new drugs. That's what gets people to write new songs and write new books. That's how you get access to the great products of intellectual labor, by giving people freedom and property rights. Right. Property rights, as Mark said, are the foundation of a flourishing, healthy, free market. Property rights. And what is it? what do property makes possible? Cooperation. Consensual exchanges in the marketplace. And this is what people don't see. We hear about the lawsuits, Apple versus Samsung. What you don't hear about are the billions of dollars that exchange hands daily between individual inventors, small companies, trade associations, and large companies with the deals that they're constantly entering in to maximize their profits and to bring products and services to the marketplace. This is why James Madison said in Federalist Number 43 that copyrights and patents are an instance where private, where private claims coincide fully with the public good, and history has proven that again and again and again. And looking to a competitive market, some companies, some property owners may choose to share their intellectual property freely, and some may choose to do it through some kind of license uh, for money, and some may do it for ways where they, uh, it's an agreement to share intellectual property across companies. And my view is that as the government, I shouldn't be picking favorites among those business models, that that's something for the market to decide. And uh, the market will decide who's the winner and the loser. And there can be a, a wide variety of business models that all thrive. I know we need to wrap up, but um, it's clear that this is a very important topic. Um, what can people do who are concerned about this issue? Um, get involved, become aware of the actual truth and facts. Uh, uh, let your congresspersons know, especially Republicans, do not weaken property rights, the foundations of our free market and our innovation economy. Do not think that this is just purely tort reform to address litigation issues, that this is about the strength of property rights. Get, so get involved, write letters, sign petitions, and let them know that you oppose the legislation that's currently under consideration in Congress. Absolutely. I agree. And, and get past the buzzwords, because there's way too yes. many buzzwords. In yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maureen, Mark, and Adam. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.